struck me with pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to get my checkbook. Just there was a good news man. News <laughs> element of that. And I'm just going to reiterate once again that you know we we take the approach of let's let's provide you a menu of really of all the options. So that if, if resources were not unlimited, but if you had way more than you thought you would have, and then let's take a look at that and let's pare it down to figure out what's what's really what's really critical. We'd rather give you too much information than not enough information on that regard. And added to that, you know, sometimes there is a windfall, and if you don't have a plan where that that funds can be allocated to, you won't be able to do it really appropriately within the bigger context of a goal and a vision that you have. So the vision is out there, the actions are set out. So as you get money in, more or less, you can apply it to this list of priorities that you've set for yourself. I'm going to hit on outdoor recreation a little bit as well, and, and what I just talked about was open space, was parks, that's kind of land, that's the area. This is kind of what goes into that space and figuring out uh, how, how, to, how to develop some of the facilities. I don't expect you to read this. If you want me to point out to you in the report where it is, I can. But basically what we did is we looked at all of the different types of athletic and non-athletic facilities that you do provide or there's interest in providing in your community. Uh, adult softball, youth softball, soccer. Uh, baseball practice facilities and so forth. And we compared that with your population to, to develop another figure of level of service. So we, we looked at your 1998 plan, what you had then, compared that population. Your 2011 11 plan and what you have now, or what you had then last year, and then what the target level of service uh, would be that we identified. And that target level of service is, uh, it's not, it's not, you know, pure uh, unadulterated science to come up with that number, but it's really a best estimate of uh, what we learned in the telephone survey from the public input and comparing our experience in other communities, what their targets are and what works for them. Uh, we also vetted this uh, and talked a bit with Bob to say, does this number make sense or is this just completely off base? And if it was completely off base, we took another look to try to figure out what might be a, a more rational uh, number to use. Uh, so we did that for athletic facilities and non-athletic facilities as well. And the result would be... I would like to point out something about the recreational facilities. You will notice that that has a five-year horizon. And that's specifically so because recreation changes over time. Trends changes. Fashion changes. So therefore, you don't want to have the builder population goal of what you need to provide. It needs to be incrementally looked at. Every, that's why you have a, a new parks master plan every five years. As opposed to acreage. With acreage, you look at the long term. You look at the build out because if you don't acquire land now, you're going to lose the opportunity to acquire. So that's a, the, the approach of a distinctly different for land as opposed to recreation facilities. Thanks, um, So the end result of that, and uh, I see most of you have, have your presentation. If you do want to look, it's page 44 in the, in the report. It's basically the same thing you have there. Uh, but the results of that are basically the need for a few athletic facilities, a couple of competitive soccer fields with, 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 Lake, uh, with what you have at Lake Park, what you have at Railroad Park, you're pretty well covered, but um, soccer is something that just is continuing to grow every, every year. And so looking proactively into the, into the future, identifying that need. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the city for cricket. You have uh, a very large um, uh, Indian population that is, that is within your city. and. We had a public meeting where there was, uh, I think, half of the, uh, the people that were in attendance knew each other. They came. They were very interested in seeing the cricket ground. Uh, in the telephone survey, there was also not a huge level of support, but there was some support for it. And we see that that is a, is a, um, uh, a desire that's growing more and more in North Texas with the population that's moving here. Now, whether that is really a critical need or not uh, is open for discussion, but it's a good opportunity to provide something that's unique here in Louisville and bring people in your community and provide something that a lot of other cities don't. It also supports the idea of diversity. Your diversity is one of your goals in, in, in your plan. So that helps to also address that particular point. Absolutely. One of the things, however, that we found that uh, really seemed to be lacking were the number of outdoor basketball uh, goals. Um, compared with a lot of cities that we've worked in, uh, Louisville has a very small number on a per capita basis. Um, looking at the telephone survey, outdoor basketball came up as the number one athletic facility that needed to be built. So we think that there's a good correlation there between a benchmark with other communities and between what, what your community is saying at once. 
we came up with a number of 19 outdoor basketball courts. Uh, it could be 20, it could be 18, it could, it could vary a little bit. And those could either be half courts, you could have 19 half courts, or you could have 10 full courts, uh, or, or you could have any sort of combination there to kind of help meet that goal. Again, this is kind of just a target to give you a, some sort of benchmark to look toward in, in figuring out the number of facilities. And perhaps to support that as well, you know, the way you can provide basketball courts, facilities, is that um, often you have in a neighborhood bar a half court. That's where people can just go, children go and just play a little bit. At the same time, if you want to provide more where they can do it together as a team and have some competition, you do it in your community parks where you may have four together or six together, full court, so that it becomes part of that synergy that you that you create with um, that particular facility. Pardon me, I, my brain's having a hard time wrapping around this. Is this, are these per, um, recommended based on that five year to match the population within five years, or are these on that 30? These are on five, five years. Okay, so this is to catch up and to match what our population would be at five years. That's what all these recommendations are. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 just, and this, is, this is a little anecdotal, but not kind of scientific any means. This is kind of keeping up with your growing population. The outdoor is kind of catching up. And then the cricket, and then the next one I'm going to talk about are a little bit about addressing an opportunity as well as providing a need that's been expressed. That gives you an idea. And uh, just to, one more thing on the basketball courts. Obviously, you probably wouldn't do this, but the idea is not to build 19 basketball courts in one location, but to have them spread across the community to some degree. Uh, and then the last one would be a, a tennis center. There's a, a lot of desire for uh, providing tennis courts, additional tennis courts within the community. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen that could be a, a really good uh, way to make that investment is to provide a, a tennis center that is a bit more than just a few tennis courts here and a few tennis courts there, but they, as opposed to basketball, as opposed to basketball courts, are clustered in one area, along with locker rooms, a pro shop, and so forth. And there's a way that you can help generate some revenue as well and help offset some of the operational costs for that. So that's a, a recommendation that's included in the, the plan. Uh, in terms of non-athletic facilities, uh, we've identified the need for three water spray parks or, or splash pads or spray grounds, whatever you may have heard those called. Uh, is anybody not familiar with, with that, what that concept is? It's, it's basically, it's, it's a way to have aquatics outdoors without having to build and maintain a swimming pool and have lifeguards on duty and all that sort of thing. There are water features that pour water over, and Wayne can speak to this later if he wants right. to or now, but they pour water over you or they spray up on the ground or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and kids really love them. It's like a playground with water incorporated into that. Can, can I ask you, with, with the tight water restrictions and the challenges that we're going to have with water moving forward, what do you really as you guys project out, those are nice, mm -hmm. but we're running out of it. Yeah. What, what, what do you see as the long-term trends on those types of you parts? want to speak to that? Are you speaking of basically a spray park or something? Like that? Yeah, those types of features. Yeah. Uh, well, those really aren't aren't wasteful because they're they're not they don't go they don't go to uh, basically your sanitary sewer line. Basically, what they do are recirculated just like the pool. So basically, if, right now. Uh, advent of some of the things that's happened in this, especially this region of the country, uh, we we're seeing that the requirements are to actually sanitize that water. So basically, you know, once you have the vessel of water in the, in the, uh, in the containment that's used to, to come above ground, what you're doing is just evaporation. So you're just you're just filling that in from the evaporation. So it's not it's not uh, Sometimes when they were first first done, actually some people just actually sprayed the water up, came down, went through the sanitary sewer line, and you were wasting water. But here you're not. You're, only only waste is, is the evaporation you have and once the vessel is full, it's full. So I don't think that would be I don't think that would be an issue of uh, of a water restriction kind of issue that you that you might anticipate. Yes, you do. That's what I'm saying. You have a, sanit rats that you have a, sanit there you have a sanitation system uh, as part of the old spray parts you probably saw did not have that. But today you actually have to have a sanitation system like you have a pool. Therefore, the cost of those have gone up quite a bit because you have this whole system over here that you actually are sanitizing the water before it goes back through. Have you uh, seen a way to control uh, rats tend to live in those underground moist, they love it, and they, well, they 
replicate like rats down there. So, and <laughs> what, um, uh, well, it's uh, one of the reasons. I guess, I guess I'm gonna say I haven't I haven't run into that issue. It's probably in terms of how it's designed, in terms of in terms of being closed for the access for that. Typically, you would typically you would close that. The only access you'd have would be the drain itself. The drain, right. the drain should be small enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to go back to TJ's comment. Isn't there a lot of evaporative loss in these systems? Well, that's what I'm saying. You do, you do evaporate, and that's one of the reasons that that area is, is a little bit cooler and gets relieved because there is some evaporation there. You know, in terms of, in terms of the square ground itself, I think this is something Adam is just kind of throwing out in terms of. Uh, you know, these are these are ways to create some amenities in a park, but it's not an absolute. I mean, if y'all felt that in this in this day and time and, and and the climate that you have relative to the water restrictions and all that, that's not a good idea. But I'm just trying to answer your, your question straight out. The evaporation part, I could tell you through some research, I could come back and tell you how much that is. But you do have some evaporation from that. My, my, my bigger question is, we do this 10, 15, 20 years out, are we are we just getting rid of it? We just plowing it under the ground because it's the point where it's, or it's, it's not a fashionable thing to do anymore, or? Well, I think it, I think very likely, you've seen a, uh, you've seen a great change in, in the aquatic, just kind of a piece of aquatic a little bit, but it's not really swimming. You've seen a, a great transition of, of things happening over a period of time. And this may be one of those things that people have done to, they've lost kind of, they've lost their sizzle a little bit, but at one time they were really new. Oh, and when, and, when the Olympics hit Atlanta, and, I know they were all the rage. And uh, so, uh, uh, it's hard to say, uh, but I think it's certainly a consideration to think about. Is, are there other things that will replace this that's more sophisticated, perhaps it addresses the evaporation side, some of those things. Uh, it's hard to crystal ball that, but I think it's I think it's a good observation your part. In, in fact, there's a parallel to, you know, 20, uh, 30 years ago, every city had swimming pools. Well, today they do away with that, so, to, to your point. Yeah. But I would suggest, Wayne, based on your experience, the cost, uh, capital cost for a, for a pool compared to a spray bar, is negative, it, I mean, so, the, the difference is so big, in terms yeah. of what it requires to have a pool than a splash pot. Sure. So if you have to give up the splash pot in the long term, it's not as much as what you would have given if it was a pool. Yeah, sometimes we'll find what's happening is a lot of pools are built. You know, you're not asking this, but it's just kind of, it's kind of a general work session, so I'll, I'll just talk, kind of talk about that. Uh, a lot of pools were built 40, 50 years ago. So we're seeing a lot of cities right now and I think y'all were one that have already kind of refreshed some of your parks, some of your, but you're hearing about Dallas, you're hearing about Fort Worth, where they've got 30 square box pools, and, and they're all in need of repair. And, and, and sometimes, I, I say that and say this, sometimes what happens is when you, what, what really happens is you consolidate the park so they, more people can come to them, you have different elements they can play, Sometimes, as a political move, you put a spray park back in that zone where you took the pool out. So you're saying we're still keeping a, a, a wet amenity there, but you're not. The problem with those, all those, is the lifeguard costs and operation of those are just killing the cities. Yeah, so I've seen these on some the chemical treatment for our pocket parks. And yeah, it, it, yeah, it adds up. Yeah. So, uh, so what was at one time just uh, a given amenity? is now a kind of treasure amenity and how do I recover the cost of operations of all the lifeguards for all those. And, that, and the spray parks have kind of sometimes filled that little void of where you take a pool out of a, a neighborhood. Sometimes they go back in, you're not lifeguarding it, but you're still, it's, it's kind of a it's conciliatory me message to that to that area and sometimes how they're used. Well, these things are, as I think you said, the by the water source and recirculation. Do you have any feel for how much one of those average size facilities would actually use to refill that tank during a, a day or a week or a year? Uh, 
and you know, I hate to guess, it's not a it's not a great amount because basically you're really churning up water pretty quickly. Uh, so you have an automatic refill into it. Did but I can I can sort of get that. The industry has it out there. Yeah. Did y'all y'all didn't identify any specific locations for the GPS? What what is lead to that question? What what is the average size freight system you're talking about? And on that average size, what would be your water capacity total? Not a refill per day, but what's your total tank size or your storage size? Thousand gallons, three thousand gallons? No, it's um, uh, twenty gallons of a mountain dew. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happens? What happens is you don't. You don't create such a large tank. You know, a tank is probably let's say 100 gallons. You, do, you don't you don't have such a large tank because what you have is automatic refill. So you know you have a level um, yeah. that's reading it. So once it gets past that level, you're feeding water into it, and so it's when it's used, you're obviously running some water into it. Uh, you're also treating that water internally like a pool. You're treating it. You're, you're sanitizing that water, and, and before you did not have to do that. That's why they were so cheap. Now you're going to say all this questioning is whether there's alternative sources of water that might be utilized that are easier to address those kinds of conservation issues. But for example, not that I'm working on this right now, but that one that goes down into the river. It's on tape. And we start recording. It's reuse. It's written now. Yeah, reuse. It's reuse. It's reuse. It's reuse. It's reuse. It's reuse. Yeah, treat the water. Treat it forever. Yeah. Super chlorinated. Yeah. Yeah. Already just throwing it out there. There's yeah. maybe some other people swim in the lake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's also yeah. just well, we got, a big challenge. You've got the sources out of the drainage directly. Regular, 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 regular park system. So you know there may be some other options. Yeah, it, which I can I can absolutely see the issue. Uh, it's yeah. Tuesday. I can't use my sprinklers yet. You got this thing running. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's more of a perception. Yeah, well, I think um, also to that is that they often they are um, they start as you press a button and then it will only run for a certain period of time. So it does run all the time. It's 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 based on the on the needs of the Probably the best deal is to have the information at hand to say, you know, on average, you say we run three hours a day with the use, and with that we use thirty gallons of water. And then you got that answer, and you can. And I and I would. I would almost bet by it that the evaporation from those is the same or much less than aeration found in ponds. Because, I mean, it's, it's basically the same, 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 principle. Principle. same principle. Absolutely. And these, you push a button, they run for what, 10, 15 minutes, you should not be that long. Well, it, what you want to say to and I don't, I don't want to spend much more time on this, I think, to me personally, but I think more data would be really helpful if yeah. you know, we yeah. go down the road on these. I definitely like what I, I, I think what would be important would be to look at this compared to our normal pool operation. At our existing pools, we do have spray features, we have slides, we have lazy rivers, and you got people getting in and getting out of the pool to drag water out all day as well. So I, I think when we do a comparison, you'll probably see less water use on a spray park than in a normal pool. On our existing pools, do we, do we have the Filtration and recycling of the water. Yes, sir. Okay. On the rat issue, is that a problem at either pool we have? No, sir. I'm talking about those okay. parks that have the water coming out of the ground and the kids play. I know that Fort Worth had a problem with it a couple Maybe years back. Same. That's Fort Worth. Huh? It's the same thing. Yeah, we don't have rats on the list, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, not that we're not attracting that. It doesn't matter how it's designed, yeah. or do you need free yeah. conduit yeah. to get there? I honestly say, I checked with, I checked with the shops out of Highland Village, and they have them right there in their shops area, right between two big restaurants, big chain restaurants. I checked them, they said they have had no problems with it. They said they, they you know, take precautions and do things to prevent it, but said they've had no problems with it. They said if they did, the health department would have shut the restaurants down. That's also a very important point, sir, because um, you can either provide that very concentrated, high-profile places like shopping centers, you get lots of use. Or oh, McKinney has the, the the standard where almost every neighbor park has a splash park. So and so they would have many. We recommend three. 
And so there's a different philosophies between different cities as how they approach this particular facility. Remember the uh, diaper issue with the water needed to be with a certain right? What was that is the bacteria called? Well, it, it, you talk about the crypto, and we have the yeah. ultraviolet uh, light system to now, take care of Now, would that be a problem at these flash parks? Well, they've, they've treated so that you don't oh, have sure. that problem. Any more is it becomes standard practice, as you say, but two years ago, it really skyrocketed that industry. <laughs> <laughs> that was, and that was prior to filtration. Oh, my gosh. Watch. Watch the line. Exactly. Don't go, go to the lake. <laughs> I do appreciate that comment and that concern there about the water use because I do think that's a very vital uh, consideration for anything. Uh, they do a lot more in there. <laughs> you do have uh, one disc golf course uh, with the new city already at Ella Woods Park, but uh, we've uh, identified the potential to add an additional. Uh, disc golf course, uh, primarily because, you know, when we look at trying to make the park system and make, make your university of your offerings appeal to, to all segments of your population, uh, people in their 20s, 30s, people without children, and people that are not senior citizens tend to, to have a, a, a little bit more of a limited uh, interest in some of the things that are traditional park elements. They love the trails. Uh, but disc golf seems to be a very popular uh, type of sport for people that age. So it's something to help target that. And it's also a very, very cost-effective way to provide amenity compared to a lot of the different uh, We do have two options. disc golf courses, one at L.L. Woods, another one out at Lake Park. And we do have a disc golf tournament going on at both courses this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a demand for them. And so, and so that, and, and, and with the discussion on the spray parks again, you know, we, we, uh, we don't assume that once you adopt the plan, you signed your name, that everything will be done. But it's kind of, you know, again, providing some opportunities and some ideas. Uh, one of the things that we have, we have also identified as a big recommendation are to make sure that each of your existing parks have a loop trail within them so that uh, kids can play on the playgrounds uh, and dad's watching and mom can go walk a mile on the trail and not be too far off. That's something that's very popular across the region. Uh, one thing that's included in there, just for good measure, is make sure that uh, all, of, all the new parks have playgrounds. All the new neighborhood and community parks that you build in the future have playgrounds. Uh, but there's also a need to renovate uh, some of the playgrounds you have existing. Uh, there was an uh, uh, image that we had up earlier of a playground that uh, is probably, I would say probably, is it Irish Lane, it's probably 30 years old, something along those lines. That's, uh, it's a, 20 years old, so it's, it's an age park that uh, or an age playground that doesn't uh, have the same uh, type of capabilities as the modern playgrounds, or, or doesn't meet the modern kind of safety requirements for new playgrounds. It's not that it doesn't meet the requirements because it's pretty far in. Uh, but it's something that could either be renovated and repainted or could be replaced with something newer to provide as an increase. It's currently scheduled for replacement to meet our ADA standards, so within the next three, four months, it will be replaced. Yeah, with the passage of 4B, we actually transferred 150,000 a year over to CIP to replace playgrounds. So we replaced how many bucks? A number. Sure. And three years ago, the sales tax started drying up. We were not able to do that transfer. But we were making a concerted effort to try to replace that. Paul, oh, you mentioned ADA. Some that the equipment's just worn out. There's, yeah, I, it's a little, it's, a, it's definitely both. It's both factors. It's uh, some of the playgrounds, uh, they, if nothing else, they need a new coat of paint. You know, so some of the things like that, just purely for aesthetics. Um, there are a few, I believe, that uh, may have gravel fall zones. Do you have any of those? They're, they're scheduled for replacement. Uh, as, as Donna mentioned, with 4B, we've replaced the line. We're, we're in the process of, of updating our, our, for the most part, our playgrounds are 10 years old or less. Uh, there are those exceptions that are out there, but they've been identified, and you know, we're working toward getting those replaced. The, I think we had three parks that didn't have the 
uh, required resilient uh, ADA service. Those are being replaced. Uh, so some of that's already in the process. But that's an example of you know the, the gravel. It still looks good. That's what we grew up on. Um, but you can't do wheelchair through it, and you can break your arm because gravel doesn't compress the way the lot these other things do. So there's th there's things like that that kind of uh, are just it's, it's time to to make that improvement. Uh, additional pavilions uh, are, are another recommendation for a lot of your parks that don't have them currently. Uh, one of the things that we hear a lot in public meetings and telephone service and so forth is we need shade. You know, it's, it's hot, it's sunny, we need some shade. Uh, and providing pavilions near the playgrounds and your parks not only provides that shady area, it provides the opportunity for people to uh, come out and, and grill some hot dogs or, or, or just bring in a picnic lunch and, and enjoy that area and stay longer in the park. And, and, you know, Increase the activity within the park and make it a more vibrant uh, well, those, location. Would that be like a rental thing or just use? Anybody that you show a first come, first serve? Yeah, a combination of both. It depends on where it is. Typically, the neighborhood parks, first come, first serve. In the community parks, whether it's at, at Central Park or Lake Park, when we have larger pavilions, those are on a, on a rental basis. Or, like at Central Park, it's really come first come first serve unless someone reserves it, right? Yeah, because there isn't a way to regulate that, but they stay pretty well booked up. Yeah, so mean, most weekends they they are. It just depends on what time the rental party gets there compared to when someone else might be in. Is that an issue at all? It has not been. Okay, so somebody is renting the staff out there to ask them that they need to move on there to rental company or something like that. Is it up to the people that show up to their rental? It's up to the people that, that, that show up to, to do that, and that's what we instruct them at, at Central Park. We don't have staff at the park all day long, so uh, if, if we do have somebody there, we assist with it. But when we rent the pavilion, we tell them that if someone's there to show them their receipt that they haven't rented, ask them to vacate it for them, and if they have a problem, to call the police. Uh, typically at Central Park, though, what we say is pretty well booked up. And there's not much of an opportunity other than during the week. Weekends are, are booked up, but during the week, there's not Okay. And some people walk off. That's what the complaint I've heard is, you know, we rented it, and we went there, and they didn't really want to leave. They just kind of argued with us. They don't want to deal with any arguments. They just want to leave, and people leave, but they don't. Just it's going to be an issue with any point. Without staff being there, that's always an issue. That's always a question. No, it does happen. Maybe I call it the least. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, a minute earlier uh, the idea of a special events park. And uh, that's the thought behind that is that with all, all of your festivals and events, uh, it could be really handy to have a park in place. And, and it could be simply an improvement of an existing park, or it could, it could be not what you would traditionally think of as a park. It could be more uh, urban in nature, or more natural in nature, or, or what have you. But the, uh, the the critical thing there would be for it to have a use in between events, so that it wouldn't just be a dead empty space, but there would be some value, some recreational value present when there's not a festival event going on, so that it could be utilized. But then in terms of its, its specific design, Parking either nearby or within would need to be uh, accommodated, and then some way of either having power and light distributed throughout or being able to quickly roll out uh, infrastructure for that. Wouldn't the, the Perks Plaza facility basically meet that need? Um, I, I think what Adam is talking about here is what some cities have is a larger park that can, it's more open. You come in, you have a lot of parking on site, and you can accommodate a lot of different events. Um, Addison, Plano, what they do with the Bloom Festival. Uh, if you want to have a, a chili cook off, if you want to have a barbecue cook off. Uh, Scottish Festival in Arlington, stuff like that. Yeah, correct. Lake Park, meet that. I think it could. I think that could be an opportunity. Parking access. Traffic has is, is been the issue at Lake Park. But it's ba it basically would be something that would allow you to expand even more of what you're already doing as, as another way to draw the line. Put aside all the papers and communities we're going to look at something like that. 
You know, it could be, I, I would imagine Addison's is probably 15 acres, maybe a little bit less, with, uh, with, uh, with a parking garage. So, I mean, there's a cost factor there. So, I mean, there's, there's kind of, you, you could, the size could really vary depending upon how you want to approach it. And, and what size and kind of caliber of festivals you want to understand is the park in Addison, I've never been to it, do they co-op with the existing parking structure, or did they build their own? Or? I don't think they just use the existing They use existing ground. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're there. Yeah. They just have an agreement. They yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, there's books. several office buildings around them that have parking garages, or right. they work with them to do the parking garage. Right. Usually yeah, they're at a fee, well. but a lot of times they're at a fee. Mm -hmm. yes. You go to a taste of Addison, you really don't need parking problems. Yeah. Well, it's, it's paid. I mean, you park those garages, but they're being paid. Yeah. But you know, anything that you do that's a success is going to have parking problems. If you don't have parking problems, you don't have success with it. Period. I mean, if, you, if you've got plenty of places to park, your events have been successful. So, and if you look at any event you go through, whether it be a balloon fest or acid fest, whatever, you're going to have a traffic and parking problem where it's not successful. Did you define the special events park in any conversation, or did you say that this is this is not you're missing a space? It's it's well, it's not that you're missing. It's that there's an opportunity based on the the, the culture and environment that y'all built up with with your tours and with with your events and with that that type of, uh, of of work that you do. It's something that could be an add-on. Figuring out the specifics of that and. and the scale and everything like that would be has, has been a whole thing on its own. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get into that. It was just as going through that came up as an opportunity. That came up as something that, that could be worth exploring. But we wanted to put it in here and, and put it in front of you to, to consider. Thank you. Uh, so the, the the actual plan for the, the high priority elements of that, uh, the development of the recreational facilities. Most of what I've talked about has been incorporated in that last segment that I talked about, the, those last dollar figures with, with the parks, with the development of parks and, and open space. Uh, the exception of that being the tennis center, uh, and, and we discussed that being a you know, kind of a full, you know, full service tennis center with locker rooms, pro shop. You could be able to have lessons out there, uh, et cetera, uh, a cost of being about $2 million to, to come in and develop the site, the park and the, and the facilities and everything along those lines. Again, it's something that could be a, a, a draw for tourism from, from across the region. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne if there's not any questions on that last bit to uh, talk a little bit more about aquatics in the in the We'll stand over here because I know I have some audience on this side. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I guess we've been taking breaks periodically. So well, does, do we need to break for five minutes? Yeah. That's what I'm okay. going to Okay, good. Thank you, sir. We'll do it five minutes.